on this region that we've called the Middle East. Um, and you can help one another out all year, hear of great opportunities. Um, I just want to put a little plug in for this award, um, why it's so meaningful to me. I started doing outreach work probably about 12, 13 years ago, and I did a story time at a library called Middle East Story Time. And every month, the librarian wanted me to bring a story from a different country and to do a little handicraft and to teach a song all from a different country every month. And there was this website called Mama Lisa's World that had some songs that I'd always go to that. Um, but it was a big, it was so challenging, you know, to find books representative of the region. And at that time, we had Naomi Shihab Nye um, was writing and, and, and a few others. Um, the beloved Elsa Martin uh, had some books. So it's just a pleasure and joy for me to see uh, the expanse of um, authors that we have now represented and stories from the region. So it means, yeah, it just means a lot. And I hopefully, I think if you're all educators as well, um, you know how much representation matters and especially in young minds. And so the work um, that, you, that we do on the Book Award Committee and MEAC in general and your work as well is very important. And um, so just wanna yeah, say kudos and hats off to you all for being here tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to uh, introduce our very special guest tonight. We have the opportunity to speak with the author of the 2020 award, uh, book award, um, Salman, the Syrian chef, as well as see a demonstration of a recipe featured in the book. So it's, um, you're in for such a treat tonight. So I'd like to introduce you to Danny Ramadan. Danny is a Syrian Canadian, excuse me, Syrian Canadian author and LGBTQ refugees advocate. His debut novel, The Clothesline Swing, won the Independent Publisher Book Award, the Canadian Authors Associations Award, and was shortlisted for a Lambda Award and longlisted for Canada Reads. The novel is translated in French, German, and Hebrew. His children's book, Salma the Syrian Chef, is nominated to the Forest of Readings Blue Spruce Award and named among the best books of 2020 by Kirkus Reviews and Library School Journal. And as you know, it won the Middle East Book Award um, in 2020 and also has been translated to German, I saw on the website. His forthcoming novel, The Foghorn Echoes, is to be released by Penguin Canada and Canagate UK in, in summer 2022. Danny graduated from UBC with an MFA in creative writing and lives in Vancouver with his husband, Matthew Ramadan, also sous chef and um, <laughs> fantastic husband <laughs> of I, the year. Anybody called Matthew a sous chef before? Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay well, you'll see. But thank you. Welcome, Danny. We will. We would you like to say a few words? We have a wonderful um, video to show. But welcome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll quickly say thank you to you, to Emma, for the lovely introduction. Thank you so much for the uh, for the beautiful host and everybody who's here. Uh, I hope you're going to enjoy the video that Angela is about to play for us. Here I go. Am I doing it or Susan is? I think so. one of our one of our. Make I, I will be doing it. I will start em the video now. Emma, thank you, Emma Arbor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dani Ramadan. I'm the author of Selma, the Syrian Chef. It's a book about uh, refugees and newcomers. Selma is this lovely little chef who came with her mother from Syria here to Vancouver and she cooks her mother a Syrian meal called full shami, which literally translates into the Messian beans. And Salma brings this meal together to uh, lift up her mother's spirits as her mother is struggling with uh, many of the challenges faced by newcomers or refugees, such as learning the language, finding a job, and many, many other things. I am really happy to introduce also my husband. This is Matthew, Matthew Ramadan <laughs> right here. And I want to say thank you to JP, my best friend who is right here <laughs> filming us, hi. So as for full shami, my friends, uh, what we're going to do is we are going to go to a Middle Eastern deli. You will find over there something called uh, Vava beans. That is Vava beans. And you'll find also 
chickpeas. Chickpeas you can find everywhere, really. Like you can find it at Safeway, you can find it at any um, any convenience store. It's the baba beans that is more Middle Eastern, and it is the main thing that we use in this meal. What happens is you open them up, and then you put them in a little pot, and you add some water so they are a bit. Um, it's like cooking with Martha. It is like <laughs> cooking with Martha. <laughs> All right, so you add some water and you start heating them up. The idea of full chamois, my friends, is that full chamois is a hot salad. It is something that we eat on Fridays in back in Damascus. It's something that the whole family gather and cook together. So I'm really happy to actually do this with my spiritual family, my best friend right here. All right. So what you need next is you need some tomatoes. I get two big firm tomatoes and I chop them. You need some parsley. You finely uh, chop the parsley. It is really fine. It's the finest parsley ever. I, I love this parsley. You need some mint leaves. Uh, you need like half an onion that you also chop. You also need uh, a lemon to squeeze right here. You're going to squeeze this lovely lemon. Um, I personally, if I'm left to my own devices, I will do way more garlic than this, <laughs> but I know that white people can't handle garlic. I love garlic. Oh my God, you can't handle I love my garlic. I most certainly can, I love garlic. You know I love garlic. Don't even with that. This video is not 100% accurate, so let's just <laughs> go with this. Uh, four garlic uh, heads, garlic, Cloves. 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 That's a like, word. Uh, That's a word. English is really funny sometimes. Anyway, so you add the garlic into a little uh, presser, or if you don't have this little presser, you can just uh, chop them. What you do also is that you add some uh, salt to the garlic, and then you can press them really hard. And that's going to take a minute. So tell me something funny about uh, Syrian things that you see me done that you're like, oh my God, that's really weird. Or funny. Oh my goodness, I kind of, like, of course I can't think of anything on the spot because um, I'm terrible with that. How about when you come out of the shower? What do I say? <laughs> um, Naiman. Naiman. Which is a very interesting, uh, Arabic has a lot of like very, very specific greetings as I'm learning, but Naiman is, Specifically, the statement that you say when someone is freshly showered or they just got out of a pool. Pool? Pool? Yeah, they just got out of a pool. No, no. They got a, like a... Oh, they just got a haircut. They just what? got a haircut. No, I, I don't, don't give have a... Like, that's, me, that's, okay, are you... That's really exotic, though. I wish there was a saying for when you come out of the pool. What you have a specific thing? saying as a greeting for someone who gets out of the shower. Yes. That yes. is pretty specific. Well, we're wishing them blessings. We're wishing them happy and blissful showers. I think that water is very blessed in our culture and I think that that's something we value. So when someone gets out of the shower, the first thing you you say as a greeting to them when they just got out of the shower is Naiman and then the response is Yenam Alek. Yes, and the response is Yenam Alek because uh, greetings in Arabic are always, um, it's like an, uh, a question and answer. You say Naiman, which means I wish you blessing and then you say Yenam Alek, which means I return the same blessing to you. You forgot to mention the sumac. Oh, I'm going back to the sumac. Yeah. Just give me a sec. Uh, so this garlic is lovely and it's pressed and it's ready. I mean, my mother is going to be quite unimpressed with how pressed this garlic <laughs> because she likes it to be mushy, but that's the limit of my garlic Turkey. abilities. Um, Where's it more then? You want to do that yeah, while I, I do squeeze that. the lemon? Well, All right, something awesome. to do. All right. So on the other hand, I'm going to be squeezing some lemon right here. Oh, sorry. Thank you, set director. <laughs> yes, thank you, set director. <laughs> and this lemon is not uh, as... Tell as... me the story behind this mortar and pestle. Oh, this mortar and pestle... Because you had it when we met. I did. I bought this in... Uh, Middle Eastern, specifically Syrian shop in North Van. Oh, really? Uh, it's because they have those like wooden... It's nice and small, because usually they're really big. They have those wooden pestles that you have here, and it's it's really limited to my my um, pressing abilities, I guess. I don't know. 
Uh, the idea is that I prefer this because it's very traditional. My God, you know how to press hard like this looks much better than what I did. Grandma taught me how to cook. <laughs> well, she didn't. Teach My mom me. didn't teach me how to cook. <laughs> All right, so we have the lemon. And we have the garlic, which I am going to ask you to give me back. If you can uh, hand me a spoon, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we add the garlic right here to the lemon. Exactly. And now we add our favorite thing in the whole damn word, sumac. Sumac is the thing that Salma was missing from her little meal. Uh, but we have it right now. Thank you. Just add as much as you would like to add. Personally, I would like to add the whole thing, but that's just me. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to add half a spoon right here. You put it down. Half a teaspoon. Just half a teaspoon, yeah. That's, that's what I did. And then you add some salt. And you add some pepper. Uh, yeah. I like I hear like some salt, and it goes on for about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're mixing the whole salad, dude. <laughs> no, I know, I'm just making. There we go. And we mix this thing together to make our lovely little... What do they call it when you make like a sauce for a salad? Dressing. Dressing, dressing, dressing. Again, English. I love how every time you, you ask me those questions, I'm always like, uh... <laughs> 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 My favorite thing is that I sometimes teach Matthew English words. I'm adding olive oil to this. I'm going to add more olive oil later to the salad because I adore olive oil. Um, Approximately how much was that in terms of what you just put uh, in? My... How much I feel like I love olive oil? <laughs> I think it was probably like an ounce. I would say an ounce or two, yes. Okay. Yeah. But so, olive oil is really important in my culture. You guys heard a lot of olive oil in this household. Oh my god, so... On uh, like two weeks, three weeks after we started dating, Matthew and I, yeah, my... he was uh, at home and I was like, listen, I would love to come and make you uh, some food. And he's like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, okay, do you have olive oil in the uh, in, at your house? And he's like, no, but I have canola, canola oil. oil. Canola oil. And I almost broke up with him that day. <laughs> it's cheaper. I was like, it's a deal breaker. Olive oil has to be in this house. And so for four years, there has been no canola oil in this house. It's only been like fresh pressed, virgin, like cold pressed olive oil. Yes, yes. Awesome. So the next thing is, now that we have the chickpeas all hot and ready, we are going to turn the fire off and we are going to dry them. I have this thing which allows me to dry it right away, which is fantastic. We're just drying this. Straight Straining them? Straining them. Why do you have a word for that? I don't know. You don't have a word for that in Arabic? Or nothing you can remember off the top of your I can't, well, I rarely use Arabic now because... I know. Because, like, I don't have a lot of Arabic speakers, and even when I do, you're always around, ruining my Arabic experiences. This looks so lovely. Mm. Uh, I think that this is going to be amazing. So, this is the oh, base of... Oh, I think. Oh my god, that's perfect. All right, so this is the base of the salad. It's hot and ready. You add the tomatoes, you add the onions, you add the parsley, you add the mint leaves, and then you add some more olive oil just because. And then you add the beautiful dressing that we had right here on yeah. top of the whole thing. Do you want a spoon or a fork? For I things? need some mixing tools. Yes, please and thank you. Just like a big fork? Yeah, a big fork. Sure. Can I have a big spoon as well? Yeah. And you start mixing them together. Here we go. So as you can see, it's as easy as ever. It's a fantastic little salad. I think this the fork is not working well. Oh, okay, here's your one another spoon. Yeah. Sorry. I forgot that you have the big. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I'm a master chef. 
Oh my god, this is going to be amazing. Yes. Oh, that just actually it does smell really good. Mm. It smells really nice. It's interesting yes. the combination of like the warm bean. I know that doesn't sound great, but the warm bean smell with like the mint and the like sumac, it yeah. smells really good in the olive. And the oil. colors too. Yeah. And the colors is very colorful. And I agree. And that's about it, actually. You are we are about to serve. So the idea is that you serve it right here. So we put some right here. There we go. Oh yeah. It is going to be amazing. And if you can grab the better bread, please. Oh yeah. I feel like I didn't add enough tomato, but you know, if you like tomato, you should add tomato. And just to make this video shorter, uh, we're going to do the rest of the dishes on our own. You eat it either with a spoon or you can do this little thing that we do in Arabia where you take a little piece of bread like so and use it like to scoop. scoop. And you Maybe. scoop out, turn it into a little bite. And eat it. <laughs> <laughs> There's the highlight of the video right there. <laughs> mm. Guess what is missing? Why is it missing? Olive oil. <laughs> no, actually. No, 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 no. Oh, it's okay. good. It's good. I'm joking. I was like, we already went through ten dollars worth of olive oil. Oh my god. <laughs> All right, so this is the little meal that we have that we got Selma to cook in the um, in the book. It is something that <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> <with my mouth. laughs> finish your chewing before you speak. Yes, mother. Uh, it is something that uh, you can definitely cook with your child. Maybe if you and your child, after you read the book, get inspired and you want to cook it. It's delicious, it's vegan as you can see, oh, yeah. uh, and it is really, really good for you. Lots of uh, colors, lots of, lots of vegetables, and you'll get to experience something Syrian. Yay! Well, we hope you all enjoyed that uh, video demo. Thank you so much to Danny, Matthew, and your friend too for preparing, for going to the work to do that. Um, Thank you, yeah. It was uh, a lot of fun actually to prepare the video and uh, we have very limited restrictions here on who can hang out with us. So uh, usually I make this meal for like 10 people, but it's only me, Matthew, and our single friend who joined our little bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we're glad to be a part of that virtually. Um, as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we're going to do now, I just saw a question pop up from Alicia, I think. Um, I've prepared a few questions. I'd like to start and then we are going to go to the chat box. So if maybe I'll just start out a bit um, with some questions, but go ahead and put yours in there. I hope that's not going to um, be too confusing. So we've just seen um, you know, this wonderful demonstration as an introduction to the story. And I guess I'm aware probably most of us may not have read it, um, but it's the dish, it's a demonstration that allowed us to see the presentation of this dish that Salma in the story creates with the help of her friends at mm -hmm. the Welcome Center in Vancouver. Her and her mother have recently um, immigrated to Vancouver. And we heard Danny give a brief synopsis at the beginning. And I'm just wondering if you could start off Danny, talking about what inspired you uh, to write a children's book after um, being a novelist and why Salma and her story? Of course. Uh, so thank you for the questions and thank you people for putting up with me and my, my, my limited cooking skills. Um, the book Salma the Syrian Chef tells the story of a little girl, her name is Salma. Uh, she is a new arriving immigrant from Syria to Vancouver, which is the city that I'm talking to you from today. I live in Vancouver. Um, and Selma, Selma's mother hasn't been as, as happy, as, as joyful as she was before they left Syria. And even when the world is completely different and safe and it's not the refugee camp, 
Selma's mother is um, overwhelmed with learning a new language, finding a job, finding uh, security, stability, and establishing herself and her daughter in uh, Canada. So uh, Selma is trying to uh, cheer up her mother by cooking a Syrian meal for her. Of course, things don't always go according to plan. Sometimes uh, Salma can find the right ingredients. She doesn't know the names of the vegetables in English. Uh, the bottle of olive oil flips, it slips out of her hand and breaks. Uh, but through the community that is around her in this new land that she moved to, other immigrants and refugees uh, from Persia, from Iran, from Jordan, from Lebanon, uh, from Venezuela, from India, who came over to uh, Canada as well, uh, as well as uh, a local teacher who is in her uh, playroom. Uh, they all sit together and, and, and find a way to create that meal for them. Um, I am a novelist in English. Uh, I have to say I'm 37, which as a gay man, that means that I'm around 180. Uh, but, <laughs> <Ow>. <laughs> um, but it's uh, when I was around 20, my first job was writing children's books. Mm. Uh, one of my very first um, uh, jobs back in Egypt, when I lived in Egypt, I'm originally Syrian, but I moved to Egypt when I was around 19, uh, was writing children's stories for uh, local magazines in Arabic. Um, and when I arrived here, I published my adult novel, The Close Line Swing, and my next book is an adult novel as well. But I've always had a, um, a love for children's books, mm -hmm. children and comics, and, and, and I, I read them for joy myself. I find them quite joyful and quite lovely. Um, but I also have been working over the past uh, two years with my sister. My sister, her name is Noor. And she has a daughter, and her daughter's name is Tala. And Tala is uh, five or six. And Nora and Tala are, uh, they were due to arrive to Canada in 2020 as immigrants and refugees. But of course, 2020 is the loving stock of all of the, the other years. So, <laughs> so things got delayed a bit. But uh, Nora and Tala were um, a, a huge inspiration for me because I went through the experience of arriving here as a refugee five, six years ago, and I went through that experience with uh, a support network, with my community as a queer person, with other queer people around me, uh, with the fact that I spoke uh, English fluently, but I'm looking at the experience of how my sister, who is a hijabi woman, who is a person who might not um, right away find their kin, find their tribe here in Canada, and how she might be challenged and that is the story that truly inspired me to, to mm. look at, at the immigration experience from that perspective. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, keep, keep the questions coming, um, and we'll, we'll get to those um, real soon. So for me, I, I hear with, in the story, the particular story of Salma and her mother, or the particular um, experiences you're thinking of your, your sister you know, and your niece having, um, a particular story, but also it kind of represents more generally immigrant experiences, right? Like with learning new words and um, looking for your ingredients, going to the grocery store. Um, and we learn about the dish and, and foods. Are there other ideas or aspects of Syrian culture that you hope to convey um, to readers in the story? Is there anything? Yeah. yeah. We I have to say, like Syrian culture, sadly speaking, because of the last 10 years and how, and I can't believe that I'm saying 10 years so nonchalantly, it has been 10 years of the civil war in Syria. And because of those last 10 years, our, our, our common understanding as a society of what Syria is, as a North American society of what Syria is, is extremely limited to those to the narrative of those 10 years mm -hmm. of a dictatorship versus terrorists versus rebels versus mm -hmm. influence from Turkey or Russia and Iran and Lebanon and it's it's very political very complex but for me it's the place where I grew up it's it's the place where I climbed the tree for the first time it's the place where I kissed a boy for the first time it's the place where I found my first love and then 10 minutes later he broke my heart but that's besides the point 
it is um, it is really dear to me. And also, Syria is a country as a as a as a country. Well, Damascus actually as a city is seven thousand years old. It's what it was one of the very first capitals in the history of humanity. Uh, Assyrian people, there is uh, Ashuris, we call them in Arab, Arabic. Uh, Assyrian people are uh, one of the very first um, uh, civilizations in the world. They are uh, predating the, the pharaohs. They were around, they were even before the pharaohs. Um, it's funny, the only time that I managed to actually see Assyrian um, artifacts is when I went to the Louvre in Paris because all of their remnants um, has been taken by the French to, to Paris. So connecting to that culture is really important to me. And I'm hoping that I can, through the work that I do, through the, the mosaic around the book, the book is covered in those mosaic pieces. Um, I, can, I can deliver a message that Syria is bigger than just the narrative that we have for it here in North America. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was also just curious about some of the characters in the book. There were a variety. Um, we have Nancy and Jad, Amir and Malik, Aisha and Granny, Dunya. Um, is there a reason or were there certain inspirations behind those people or it was kind of just out of your imagination? Uh, there was actually. So um, I, I believe quite importantly in representing my own culture and being quite, um, quite focused and detailed when I'm representing other cultures in my work. Um, so while I was writing Salma the Syrian Chef, I wanted to represent other cultures through the joint experience of immigration and refugees. Mm. Um, and given of how important that is for me, I tweeted to uh, a lot of people on social media and was like, can you tell me about your favorite dish? from your heritage, from your culture. Mm -hmm. And then um, a Jordanian person, Jed, uh, who's on Twitter, uh, was like, hi, uh, my favorite Jordanian dish is blah, blah, and blah. And I'm like, oh, OK, so we had a conversation about Jordanian culture. And then I named the Jordanian character in the book after him. Mm -hmm. And that's literally what I did for every character that I don't actually have uh, a name like that I, I don't have a claim over their identity. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to, uh, I, I hanged out with a poet from Calgary. Her name is Raya and she is uh, originally from Indian descent. And she is the one who I ended up naming uh, a little girl from India after her in the book and so on and so forth. It just, um, my friends are all over this book. And it's funny, actually, there's <laughs> the only character that uh, you will see, hold on, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So um, the, the illustrator, Anna Braun, decided that she is going to, because I created two characters, Amir and Malik, mm -hmm. and they're from Lebanon. And I'm hinting that they are a queer couple, that they're a gay couple. Uh, and then Anna Braun, she, she designed the character of Amir after me. Like the character of my hair literally looks like me, <laughs> and I, I was, uh, I was quite moved. Honestly, it was, it was really mm -hmm. awesome. I, I remember you wanted, to, you were going to perhaps read a couple pages. Should we still do that? Uh, it's up to you. Um, I think yeah. People are nodding their head. I see well, you yeah. have nodding your head. Can we hear a, a brief selection? Yeah. Maybe the start. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Salma, the Syrian chef, written by yours truly and art is by Anna Braun. Salma watches the Vancouver rain from her apartment window in the Welcome Center. It is different than the sunny days back in Syria. She still can't pronounce Vancouver, but her friends tell her that her ways of saying it are more fun. Vancouver, Salma says to Mama, but Mama is making dinner. Vandurar, Salma rolls her R's, but Mama won't look up from her English classes. Vancouver, Salma finally succeeds, but Mama is busy calling Baba back in Syria. Baba will join them in Syria soon. 
Selma's heart aches like a tiny fire in her chest when she thinks of Baba. She wonders if Mama's heart is burning too. Mama used to giggle with her friends in the refugee camp. It sounded like the ringing bells of the older boys' bikes. Now, after a long day of job interviews and English classes, Mama barely smiles when tucking Salma in. Maybe if Salma can make Mama laugh, Vancouver will feel a little more like home. Salma draws Mama a clown balancing on a ball on top of an elephant. She tells Mama a knock-knock joke about bananas and oranges that she learned in language school. She even hides behind the fridge. She jumps out and screams, poo! But all she gets is Mama's sad smile, full of love, but empty of joy. I want to make Mama laugh. Selma rushes into the playroom and almost crashes into Nancy's chair. She's been sad for a long time. When was the last time you saw Mama happy? Asked Nancy in her broken Arabic. Salma imagines a waterfall of Mama's many sad faces since they left Syria. How about you draw a picture, Nancy says. Drawing helps me when I forget my good memories. Selma look at, looks at the colorful crayons. Her memories of Mama's smile shine like a beautiful rainbow over that waterfall. Salma draws her home back in Damascus, a yellow house with a garden surrounding it like a necklace. The garden had a tree with green leaves and a bird's nest with three little eggs. She colors the living room's walls purple. Were the walls really purple? Nancy asks. No, Salma says, but it's okay to add new colors to my own memories. She draws Baba at the table. Mama carries a freshly made dish of full shami, a big smile on her face. Salma, she can't bring Baba here sooner. She can't rebuild their own home, but she, suddenly she knew what to do. Mm, thank you so much. <laughs> of course, it's my pleasure. <laughs> All right. The rest of the story, please. You're going to need to get the book, everybody, <laughs> to hear what, what does Selma do? Does she succeed? Um, I have a couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll go to our, um, to, to our audience joining us. Um, so in pre preparation for tonight, I watched a TED Talk, a very moving um, TED Talk that you did, and you talked about your own experience, um, immigrant experience, and, and likened yourself to a tree being uprooted. Mm -hmm. Um, and you ask the audience, you know, to consider, acknowledge immigrants' own lives and the beauty that they've left. Not everybody just wants to come to the land of opportunity. There's mm -hmm. a lot of beautiful things that left, um, that they left behind, you know. Um, and so I was wondering what you'd want readers who don't have immigrant experiences to take away um, from Selma and her story. And what would you want people who, who could relate um, to having an immigrant background to take away? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you want it to affect people, the story to affect these different groups of people? Mm -hmm. I appreciate that question quite a lot. I really do. I, I like, I look at my own experience as, as a refugee. I arrived to, to Canada as a refugee in 2014. I, um, I was a refugee for two years in, um, in Lebanon. And before that, I was living in Syria, between Syria and Egypt. And when I arrived, I have to say truthfully, I have been in refugee camps, I have been arrested by the Syrian regime, I have been a gay man in the Middle East, and the hardest year of my life, I can tell you truthfully, was my first year in Canada. And that's because when you arrive, you are taken away from everything that is normal for you. Um, we have different ways of communicating. I'm not saying that my way or your way is better. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's different. We have different ways of communicating. Words, facial expressions, gestures have different ways of meaning. 
Um, and I left behind me, yes, I left behind me the civil war, the homophobia, but I also left behind me that I know all the streets of my city by heart and I know where I am. If you blindfolded me and threw me anywhere in Damascus, I know where I am just by looking around. And now I am in a completely brand new strange world. So um, while trying to establish myself, building myself from zero, um, I was, my last job before I arrived was working for the Washington Post. I was a reporter for the Washington Post, but then I arrived here in a tiny little magazine that they get um, as they're walking out of the metro, as they're walking off the train, wouldn't even see me for an interview. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of questioning your own value because you arrive here and you're starting literally from zero. Um, so... I think that a lot of a lot of us who never had the immigration experience in my immediate life, um, a lot of us um, maybe come from immigration backgrounds, maybe your parents or grandparents mm -hmm. or 300 years ago, uh, you might have come from an immigration background. Um, so I think that those who never had it in their own firsthand experience as an immigration need to reach out with empathy mm -hmm. and with Self with self-determination for the refugees, with recognizing of the refugees' self-determination. I think it is the solution of all the problems doesn't just present itself to you at the airport when you arrive. That is not, that is not how life works. Mm -hmm. And if we think that this is how life works, that is a bit naive, I have to say, um, mm -hmm. because you need to establish yourself from zero. Mm -hmm. For persons, for people who arrived here as immigrants, what I see, because I also work with immigrants um, in my advocate's um, work, what I see is a lot of self-doubt. And, and that, is, that is really normal because you were one thing before you arrived here and now you're a completely different thing when you're here. And a lot of those folks wonder like, what is wrong with us? Why can't we just fit in? And I just want to tell you, you are fine where you are. Mm. You're doing your best and that by itself is enough. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to question yourself all the time. You don't have to wonder all the time if you are doing the best uh, there is because you are doing the best you can today and that is more than enough. There is no way for you to do more than the best that you can. Mm. It is just, simply impossible. So if you don't feel that sense of belonging today, that's because sense of belonging to a new place after immigrating to it is not a magic solution. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time and that's totally fine. It took me six, seven years more, it took me a, like still sometimes, I, I, I still sometimes find myself searching for that sense of belonging. Other times I do, like other times I walk in the city in Vancouver and I call it home and sometimes I don't and it's, it's normal. There is, there's complexity to who we are as, as people and then add through that immigration experience and that by itself just complicated all over the place. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one, actually, if I can get two quite quick questions in. Um, you also said in your TED talk um, when, you know, we were talking about likening yourself to a tree and finding a place, you had a place that you're flourishing, you uprooted, and then you said that every tree has its role to play in the ecosystem that it's a part of. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, what roles do you hope to see Im new immigrant people or new immigrant children playing in Vancouver? What roles do you imagine for them, like for your sister, your niece? What's, what are the roles? I think I think the role that new immigrants play in the Western society in North America, in Canada, or in the US is whatever they held the role they wanted to be. It could be literally, you can be a teacher, you can be uh, a lawyer, an artist, a storyteller, or a mother, or a cook, or you can be the person who just survived all of this and wants to sit down and watch Netflix and chill. You can literally be any of those things and that is totally fine. It is completely up to you. I'm not here to tell you what is your role. That is something that you have to figure out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you can figure it out today, that is totally fine. You'll figure it out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
Thank you. Last question that will lead into our other questions um, that our right. audience has. It's just that how might teachers, how do you envision teachers using this book in the classroom? Um, what would you want? Well, I think you've kind of answered how, what you'd want young students to learn from the story, but um, we've got someone also that asked if you would visit schools. Um, so how would you envision the, the book being used perhaps in a classroom? Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm famous on Twitter, which I'm really happy about that. <laughs> but <laughs> what happens is a lot of the teachers uh, tweet at me pictures of their classrooms or their Zoom screens or stuff like that, showing me what they're doing with their with the classes. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of them use the book as a window towards recognizing your own immigration experience, be it uh, as a first-hand exper experience or somebody who's coming from uh, uh, a family who immigrated. So they ask their students to talk about, to, to ask their parents about their immigration, about their favorite um, authentic uh, meal. Uh, they ask the children to uh, talk about Syria and to have a conversation about Syria that has nothing to do with the last 10, 10 years. So um, something about the history of Syria, the capital, the, the location, why the borders are designed the way they design. It looks like a big triangle. So why the borders are designed that way. So that was a, uh, a good, uh, for a bit of older students, so eight or nine, it was a good window to have a basic conversation about colonization, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and the impact of colonization back in the in the early 1900s that resulted in the borders that we have in the Middle East right now. Um, I also do visit classrooms. Yes, I do that all the time. And <laughs> I'm, I'm presenting you now with my uh, intellectual persona. But when I have the classroom with uh, seven-year-olds all over my Zoom, I turn into a bit of a clown. <laughs> I think you saw bits and pieces of that while we're watching the cooking video. Um, yeah, like I, I cater my personality, I guess, to the uh, to the audience. And you folks seem to be um, the people who wants to see me being intellectual rather than me just like singing songs and jumping around. <laughs> like, Salma, yay! <laughs> so yes, I do visit classrooms and I'm happy to visit. I think she, the person asked... Uh, how you can get in touch with me to do so, you can go to my website, which is danielramadan.com. So first name, last name, dot com. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for your questions in the chat. I'm going to start on up to the top and see if we can get everything in. Uh, people loved the video. And Emma can handle a lot of garlic. She wants everyone to know. Um, Okay, well, there's a question that is the book translated into French. Would love to read it to the French class at elementary school. Oh, and I see that the next question is also about is the book translated? Oh, and it's right there, Eric, sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sadly, it's not translated yet to French or to Arabic. Uh, funny enough, it's translated to German. It's coming out in Germany um, in the next couple of uh, weeks, actually, which I'm very happy about. Um, my German uh, publisher for the Close Lines Way really enjoyed the book and they decided to translate it. Um, if you know a publisher who publishes French books and they want to publish the, the book in French, I am more than happy to put them in touch with my publisher. Um, hustling, I tell you. I, I would say um, if you feel like you want to translate it, it's very simple. Um, so if you, and it's like 1,500 words, so if you feel like you want to translate it to French and use it in your own classes, whichever way that you want to, uh, please go ahead, as long as you limit your use of it in your own classroom. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, I'm sorry, currently it's only available in English and German. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Susan just commented that the dish is so different from Egyptian food. Oh yeah, I love Egyptian food, Susan. You have no idea. Like it is, uh, they they mush it. It's like a mush thing. It's really, yes, it's it's a mush thing with a lot of uh, um, olive oil and and it's it's tahini, really, you know? and tahini. Yes, mm -hmm. Ooh, yes. Mm, yeah, I agree. And kamun, you know, they put a lot of kamun, <laughs> yes. but I don't think they put sumac in it. But mm -hmm. I'm going to try this. It's, it really looks great. 
Thank Am you. I allowed to smush it a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> she smushed, or do the, beans, do the beans need to stay the distinct? <laughs> it would be a beautiful fusion between Syrian and <laughs> okay. made of cooking and full shammy. Right, um, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I lived in Egypt. I didn't know if you know that, Susan. I lived in Egypt for seven years. Um, I lived in Dui, in Cairo. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, it was a lot of fun. Nice. I lived mm -hmm. in Dui. It was, there was a, you know, whatever, there was a home hotel we had to stay, students. But okay, let's, next question is um, from Pat Austin. She noted, or Pat, I'm sorry, Pat noted much metaphoric language. Mm -hmm. Was that choice an influence of Arabic? What well, that choice and influence in Arabic? Okay, so in my in my writing in general, I am always every review that I got for the Clothesline Swing for Salman Syrian Chef is that I use metaphors quite a lot, and I am um, I am masterful in using metaphors. Mm, I'm so proud of myself. It's it's honestly it is um, it's a trick of the language indeed. Arabic in itself is a very metaphorical language. When you speak, you use metaphors all the time. Um, Arabic is a complicated language, quite a lot, to be honest. Like, for example, uh, English is 6 million words in total. So the, the English dictionary is like this big. Uh, Arabic is 560 million words. So the Arabic dictionary is a bit like a shelf of books. Um, so Arabic in itself is built upon metaphors, upon metaphors, and every word becomes a metaphor. And and um, and yeah, like this is how my brain thinks. My brain thinks in metaphors. So when I write in English, it just translates itself well to that. Um, I'm happy that you sewed the metaphors in there, and I think it's beautiful that we allow children to read things that are a bit more complicated and allow similes and and metaphors. They are. They're wonderful and they open new ways for for children to think i think mm -hmm. what a great question hello again and welcome everyone i see jean campbell hi jean anyone if there are any other questions please please drop them in here um do we have all teachers on or do, can are some folks librarians teachers you can raise your hand for those who have your cameras on or just Tanya is a teacher, I believe. Tanya raised their hand. Okay, thank. Oh, yeah, I don't see everybody on my screen. I, I do. I okay, see everybody good. on my screen. Okay. Uh, Laura says that uh, Laura is a librarian. Uh, ba, ba, ba. And there's an adjunct uh, for free st student oh, teaching. Okay, eight. Wow. I am in a good company. <laughs> Maybe I should cool down on the clown thing and just be intellectual for a bit. <laughs> No, we need to clown around every now and then. We have too many Zoom, serious Zoom meetings, so this is good. Uh -huh. Can you, thank you, okay, here's another. Can you speak to um, the homeschool parent? Welcome everybody. Can you speak to the ending, the ending of the story? Um, sure. Is that the question? Perhaps, yes. But so don't um, give away, spoiler alert. Everybody just close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I, I can't because we're recording i can't actually read the whole book for you folks uh but the ending uh speaks about so salma goes and she decides that she is going to look for the recipe and the local translator english to arabic is jed and he who's jordanian and he offers her the recipe she doesn't know how to get the um she doesn't know the names of the vegetables in english so she draws them instead of uh, saying them. I, um, she also um, communicates with people that don't speak the same language through body movements, through uh, um, things that allow her to have that conversation through um, drawing sometimes. Uh, she gets to know other people in the welcome home that she lives in. The welcome home is um, a specific service here we have in Canada where um, all the new immigrants and, and refugees live there for a good six weeks before they are actually released, not released, they're, they're free to roam, but before they find their own home and they find their own place. So they establish them there. They, they offer them services like how to get their ID cards, how to get their bank statements, stuff like that. Uh, so she gets to know everybody in the welcome center 
uh, but she doesn't make the meal perfectly the way she wants to make it. And then she gets quite frustrated with herself that she didn't make the meal perfectly. And somebody, a wiser person, comes in and offers her that while things might be different here, they're equally beautiful. So even if your meal is not made the way that you made it back in Syria, it is still great and it's made with love and that's enough. Um, and then she offers the meal to her mother and the mother uh, accepts it and she laughs in joy joyful happiness. Um, my goal with the ending, to be honest, I have to say like she, I didn't want an, an easy wrapped up, wrapped up ending. I didn't want uh, the mother to find a job and now she speaks the language fluently and now everything is great. I wanted to talk about a moment of shared joy between that mother, her daughter and the new community that they're bringing together. But also I wanted to state that the journey is still long before those people find um, complete comfort, complete establishment in their new culture. So the ending is quite joyful. It, it goes into beautiful dreams and stuff like that. But at the same time, I, I try to be a realistic writer when I think about the immigration experience. Excellent question. And I think there was a clarification. Pat was wondering what the dream possibly was at the end of the story. The dream goes on all night. Ah, uh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the last page says the dream goes on all night. So the page before it, uh, Salma is now uh, hanging out with all of her new friends and her mother on bikes on Vancouver seawall. And she's dreaming of, of that beautiful um, drive that they're going through, like a bike ride that they're going through. That's, the sky is colored in purple. And she's, she feels like there's a sense of joy, sense of, of happiness in there. And her dream of being on that, on that bike um, lasts all night long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we missed a question from Colleen. Uh, Danny, yes. what is something that would surprise us about the process of writing and publishing a children's book? Any behind the scenes detail? Ooh, I love that question. Thank you, Colleen. So this is 1,600 words of a book. I wrote 40,000 words for this book. In total, I wrote 40,000 words for this book. So there was at least 20 drafts of this book back and forth between me and my editor. Uh, and that's before we even went and hanged out with the uh, illustrator who created the book. So there was there's a lot of navigation of the book because I'm trying to be intentional. Me and my editor were trying our very best to be intentional. Mm -hmm. So before we actually started reaching that, that final product that is the book, we wanted to sit down and get to know the characters that we're trying to, to create and get to know the values that we're trying to, to insert in the book. So we wanted Salma to have self-determination. So I, we kept changing the book until we made a version where Salma was the determinant person where she is making the decisions, she is leading the book rather than the adults coming in and being like, you do this, you do that, and you're, now you're done. Uh, we wanted the ending to be intentionally um, open so I didn't want the ending that the father now arrived and the father got the job the minute that he arrived and the mother now speaks the language and Salma is happy in school. We wanted an ending that brought joy, but at the same time allowed a space for the students to think, oh, okay, like they are joyful today, but the problems are still there. You know what I mean? The challenges are still there. Um, so yeah, like we, I would say the biggest thing that surprised me through this process is that writing for children is not as easy as, as it feels sometimes. Um, and the biggest surprise, to be honest, is that you're not just writing for children. I'm writing for you too. Like all of you today, as you're sitting here, 
I'm writing for the children who you're going to read for, but I also, you're the people with money who are going to go to the bookstore and buy the book. So if you didn't pick up the book and you fell in love with it first, the child would never reach that book, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit more complicated than I expected it to be, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So we're just almost about to the end of our time. We've got about three more minutes. Um, someone is asking about do you have any ideas about to get the book translated into uh, more languages? Um, and, and then anything that you just like to add at the end, I wanna be respectful of the people's times, uh, time. So uh, do mm -hmm. contact, reach out to Danny though, uh, via his website. Um, but is there anything that people can do to advocate for the book being uh, translated into other languages? I honestly, this is, this is, um... As somebody who got translated to multiple languages before with the Foghorn Echoes, with the, sorry, the Clothesline Swing, um, it's really about a publisher falling in love with the book. It's, you can, I can advocate for the book to be translated to Arabic or translated to French or whatever. And I can, I can scream about it from the rooftops or tweet about it until I'm blue in the face, but unless a publisher falls in love with the book, that is, that is not going to happen. So if you, if you put it out there, if you shared it with your students, that is all that I can, I can, I can ask from you. I appreciate that you want it to be translated to other languages. God knows that that would be fantastic for me. I thank you that you want to, to publish it in other languages. I would love for that to happen, but I don't think it's on you, my friends. I think mm -hmm. what is on you, the thing that you can advocate for is for this book to reach your students, your people. And that's, that's, that's all the joy that you bring me, to be honest. So everyone buy the book. If you have a library, if you're at a library, if you're in a classroom, for your family, buy the book. Actually, I do have one more question about the illustrator. How did you connect with the illustrator? And then we're, we're going to have to be done. Ah. <laughs> I'm, just curious. I'm curious how that happens. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. So Anna Pran, I'm hold up. Ah, here we go. Yeah. So Anna Pran is a Vancouver illustrator. I've never met her in my life. We only communicated over email. Um, and she is a person who's very engaged with the Middle Eastern arts. So she she draws a lot of Middle Eastern uh, thematic arts. And the folks at uh, Anik Press introduced us. And I'm, I'm of the belief that when we're collabor collaborating, I'm the best at, at what I do, and I should trust the other person to be the best at what they do. So I completely let Anna Braun do whatever the hell Anna Braun wants to do with the book. Uh, she did not disappoint. She came back with a beautiful, beautiful drawing. The only thing that I, after I saw the first draft, is that I was like, actually, I have this backgammon that I bought in Damascus. Oh, really? It's a beautiful set of backgammon that I bought in Damascus. Oh, wow. It is, um, the mosaic art is uh, a very big, important art in our culture. It is so beautiful. It is my favorite possession. God knows it is literally my favorite possession. So I shared pictures of the, of the backgammon with Anna Pran uh, from every angle, actually. Mm -hmm. And then I asked her if she would frame the book with it. So she mm. did. Uh, the cover is framed like this, every page actually within the book, uh, regardless of where you end up, is mm -hmm. framed with Arabic mosaic, the Messian mosaic specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that having the framing device as Syrian as it is right now allows for this, she's in Vancouver, Selma is in Vancouver, but every frame around her is the Messian. Mm -hmm. I thought that that's very representative of the Syrian culture, even when you are in foreign lands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Danny Ramadan, uh, for sharing with us your wonderful work um, and taking all of our questions. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Susan and Emma. Um, this was such a delight uh, and pleasure, real honor and pleasure for me. Um, so please do get involved with me. I connect with Danny at dannyrabadon.com or on Trick Twitter. Um, and please be in touch with him and support his work. Um, Susan I, and Emma, I'll turn it back over to you. I am reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Susan, you're still muted, my friend. 
say, um, I, I'm, I'm mute as usual. Um, thank you so much to both of you, Angela and Danny. It was very pleasurable. Thanks to all of you for being here. And I want to uh, invite you to look out for the rest of the series of the World Area Book Awards that are coming once a month now until I think May. Uh, so uh, have a great evening and enjoy your time. And we'll thank you all. And of course, join Middle East Outreach Council. Thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you very much, folks. Have Thanks, a good night. Danny, so nice to meet you. Such a pleasure. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.